Okay, so welcome everybody to uh, this. Is, for me, it's the last session because you know, from 8 till 10 p.m. It's probably last until 10 p.m. I don't mind to be a bit extra for everybody. And uh, to start with a little bit of a talk, and then we do this stuff in kindness meditation. And then afterwards, it's going to be maybe 10, uh, 10 to 9. What's that? 10 to 1 for you people over in UK or other times in other parts of Europe or the world. Then we could actually see what happens afterwards. But first of all, I was just talking offline with the, the co-hosts and with uh, Venerable Chanda just about you know, the, the stillness, the quietness, the peace. And it's the last meditation which I did. I didn't, I don't really um, plan things these days. And sometimes it takes a lot of trust not to plan things. So that when you start a talk, you can actually start a talk with no notes, no idea what you're going to say, and just uh, see what happens. And very often when I give a talk like that, stuff comes out of my mouth which surprises me. You know, it's like I'm not really um, doing the talking. And much of the time I've talked for so long and uh, so many different venues that I'm confident enough now just to open my mouth and start talking and see what happens without much of a plan of how the Dharma is going to come out. And that's when I don't get in the way and I just let it happen. Sometimes magical things happen, some ideas, some um, uh, concepts, perceptions about meditation or about the, the world, they just come out by themselves. And quite frankly, and honestly, sometimes I'm listening to myself talking and I think to myself as I'm talking, wow, that was really good. Where did that one come from? Because it becomes like an automatic process. Just like I was saying that a few times when I've been doing walking mission, sometimes you're walking backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, you know, for a reasonable length of time. And then suddenly you realize you're actually not doing the walking. It is just the body's doing the walking and you just walk slowly to the end of the path and you turn around and walk back. It's totally an automatic process. It's not so sort of amazing because apparently soldiers used to do that during long marches before they had you know, lorries to take them all over the place. When they were marching from place to place, sometimes I'd have to march all night and they go to sleep. They're still <laughs> marching. The march became an automatic process they were so used to. So the body will do them walking and they will do sleeping. Or if you're a meditator, you would just do this wonderful watching, observe, observing the body walking, but not giving any instructions at all. And the body would actually do that walking all by itself. And it's wonderful to watch. So you don't need to get involved. You can let things be. And I didn't actually make this point, but sometimes people talk about letting be and letting go. What's the difference between the two? And what you let go is what you let go of and what you let be. So what one lets go of is this thing called the five hindrances. Things like wanting and ill will or negativity, sloth and torpor, restlessness and doubt. But in particular, you let go of control. It's wonderful to let go of control because when you just let things be, you just, oh, I'm confusing you again. When you let go of controlling, wanting, will, determination, all of that stuff, you let that just go. And especially the body relaxes so easily. If you try to relax the body, it gets tense. If you leave it alone, it relaxes. And that's one of the reasons why we use things like loving kindness, because loving kindness encourages you to let go. I still remember so many times you know, you're my own mother. And obviously, you know, a son loves his mother very much. And whenever I was sick or couldn't go to sleep, you know, as a young child, you ask your mum, call her, she'd come in and just give you a kiss, stroke your head. And that was just enough, that degree of kindness was enough to relax you and give you that sense of being able to let go so you can go into sleep. You weren't worried. So the kindness is one of the means why you can let go so deeply. And the trust, you trust your mother knows what's going on. 
and that she can look after you. So you don't need to worry about a thing. Mother's here. And the same with, you know, when I let go, it's just so safe in meditation. And it's always more safe than when I don't meditate. When you don't meditate, you're moving around. Sometimes you're tight in your body, so it's very easy to, if something gets hit, it gets bruised or cut. When you're so relaxed, nothing can harm you. This is, I don't know if I told this story to you, but sometimes uh, I'm amazed at how people take these teachings and what actually happens. When I was visiting Sri Lanka some years ago, <coughs> I was supposed to be on as a conference. And so in the evening, I was supposed to be relaxing in the little hotel room, which they gave to me. And I was relaxing there and a call came in saying there's one of my disciples wanted just to come and pay respects. And so I thought, oh, okay, yeah, it's only five minutes paying respects. So he came in with about two dozen people <laughs> to pay respects. <laughs> so, oh, you know, I'm just pretty easy going, okay, come in. And when he actually came in, he started talking about his group. They were meditating, following my instructions, the disciples. And then he told me about one of the disciples there, one of his group members, who had this you know, really good ability to get into jhanas, the real jhanas. And you know, we do it really often. And so the head of this group, who wasn't as good a meditator as this fellow, he decided he was a doctor, like a, a medical doctor. So he decided to do an experiment on this fellow while this fellow was actually in a jhana. And he never told this gentleman what he was about to do. But while he knew this fellow was in a jhana, just talking, shouting to him, make sure that he was really deep. He couldn't hear a thing, this fellow in the jhana. He got out a scalpel and he uh, put an antiseptic on the, what's it called, like, um, the alcohol on, the, on the, uh, the flesh to make sure it was sterile and then tried to um, in, make an incision in his arm with a really sharp scalpel. And so he, he drew the scalpel across the flesh it wouldn't go in, wouldn't penetrate the flesh at all. He said it was amazing to see that. So even with a scalpel, a sharp scalpel, and the fellow didn't know what was going on, it was just in the jhana, you cannot cut the skin. Ooh. And he actually videoed it. He did say he was going to send me a copy of the video, but he hasn't yet. But then afterwards, when the meditation ended, when a gentleman came out of meditation, he told the, this gentleman what he'd, he'd done. He said, I'll forgive us. I should have asked permission first of all, but I didn't. Hope you don't mind. Of course, there's no damage done. So the, the gentleman in the jhana didn't sort of, uh, when he came out, didn't really complain at all. But the doctor said, let's do another experiment. This time I'm going to ask permission from you. Can I make that incision when you're in jhana? And this was a very simple, easy going man. He said, yeah, okay. He gave permission to the doctor. So the next time when he got into the jhana, the doctor did the same thing just uh, swabbed the, the flesh to make sure that you know, it was sterile. And they got out of the same scalpel and made an incision. This time it went in easily. And of course, you know, a cut appeared and blood came out. But the fellow didn't feel a thing. But because he gave permission, the incision could actually cut the skin. And then the doctor just you know, stitched it up very quickly and then just disinfected it, put a bandage on. And then later on, he came out of meditation. So it's amazing just the stories which you get into about how safe meditation is and how, you know, you, you know without giving special permission, you just you can't be injured at all or hurt. Wonderful thing. But actually how that meditation happens, you, when you really let go, you've got to be able to let go. And that the idea of like safety it really helps you. You don't need to worry about anything in the whole world. Not only that, but just the sheer joy about of it, the bliss upon bliss upon bliss. It gets deeper and more refined, not just ordinary bliss, but some happiness which you've never experienced before, which is more and more refined. You know, celestial bliss, just even deeper than, than heavenly bliss. Incredible stuff. And that's one of the reasons why when you get into these deep meditations at first, you think, wow, this must be it. This is just, oh. You vanish, incredible bliss, pure love, sometimes 
sometimes people, it's amazing how many people just explain to themselves the bliss of a first jhana as um, incredible love, um, how was it, impersonal love, unbounded love. And the reason they say that is because metta, loving kindness, love, is just so close to our experience of, of bliss, especially the selfless bliss, which is you know, part of that jhana experience. But then what happens, you get into those states and then you go deeper. And that just really blows your mind. I say blow the mind because, you know, that was, I'm a child of the 60s, or 50s when I was born, but 60s going to rock concerts and stuff and blow your mind. And actually, it's so what you're doing. You just your perception of bliss and happiness just really gets overturned. And when you go into a second jhana, oh, that's even more refined bliss, much more blissful than the first jhana. And you didn't really, you couldn't really anticipate that such a bliss was possible or existed in this world. A bliss which is so still, which no, nothing moves. It's a bliss of peace, of stillness. Which sometimes people will think is boring because they never experienced such a state. But when those things happen to you, well, it's incredibly powerfully happy, which is one of the reasons why it, you can't just stay in there for a minute or two minutes. The deeper the meditation, the longer you stay. And that's a sign that these are deep meditations. It's so blissful, so happy. You stay long periods of time. Now, at least a few hours. And so, and it's not because you haven't got any choice in the matter. It's not up to you. Because, you know, that choice has just disappeared for a while. Just like your body disappears, choice disappears. Having a wonderful time. So when you let go of control, you let whatever's left be. You don't disturb it. Whatever's left after you let go of control, then they, things start to disappear, start to go into your lotus. You can't just say, just let things be, let it go, be content, like I did in the meditation. But then what you're really doing is you're being aware and you're caring, you're being kind. And kindness is something you can always do. And it's no, basically not what you really do. Kindness and caring is looking upon this moment with this wonderful metta, lovely compassion. You care about this moment. You care about it so much, you get this beautiful energy of acceptance and warmth and joy. You don't decide to do this, it's just what happens. And when metta gets very strong, it's so easy to give love and kindness There's so much. And especially when you can rest and your mind becomes empowered, as I've been saying all this retreat, the more stillness you have, the more you meditate, just the more power your mind has. And that's when you can see so much more, you can taste so much more of your food. You can actually feel if it's cold in the air, you can feel it and it's just invigorating cold. Or if it's warm, like it has been today, it's cool down this evening now. But the warmth, they're just really just experiencing it. And first of all, it was something which is unpleasant, but then it becomes something amazing. What is warmth? The heat of the air striking the body. And then after a while, the body vanishing. What, what is that? So you start to feel so deeply. If anyone is into poetry, I don't know why that people who meditate, if they really you know, have the, the inclination, they should be able to write some incredibly po po incredible poetry, not just about love, but just about just the hot weather or about flies. This is our fly season here in Australia. And I can't miss this story. Of course, you know, that I teach and I have to <coughs> follow my own teachings, <laughs> obviously. And that was a time I've been talking about, well, look, flies in Australia. We have a season when there's so many flies around. And they were just coming to the end of the fly season here in Western Australia. And they're very um, hygienic, these flies. You know, they're, they're not born in sort of rubbish dumps or sewage pits, they're just born in the forest. And so they're very 
you know, very clean. So they're not carrying any diseases when they crawl all over you. Or what they really like to do is, I'm not sure why, they're looking for some water. So they go to the mouth or they go to the nose just to get some moisture from somewhere. So anyway, the, I was telling people in a, a meditation one day, if you do have any flies on you, just leave them alone. They're safe, they're fine, leave them. And of course, as soon as I said that, I said, well, let's do a meditation now. And as, as soon as I said that, the cameras were on me when I was meditating, and the fly landed right on the end of my nose, here. <laughs> and usually, being a lazy monk, I would go <laughs> trying to blow it away. But I realized the cameras were on me, so I couldn't do that. So I just had to follow my own teachings and let the fly be there. I didn't know that this fly was actually a Buddhist. It was a Buddhist fly, and I'll prove it with telling the story accurately. Once it landed on, it was really sort of itchy and tingly and so I couldn't watch my breath. I had to just watch the feeling of the fly's feet just on your, your skin, which is quite sensitive here. And then it started to walk around my mouth, little by little. And I got the insight, which very few people can penetrate the insight, that this part of your mouth, next to the, you know, where the lips meet together, that is the most sensitive area. So once it got past here, it was really sort of itchy and sort of tingly and just irritating. But once it got past here, it was fine. And it just walked around slowly. And then it got to this part again. It was really irritating. Not, not irritating, but just a very strong feeling. And then it went past again. So I found out that these parts are much more irritating than these parts here. But in this fly, it didn't just go around once. It went around again. And a third time. Once he went around a third time, then he flew off. Or she, I'm not quite sure of the gender. I never looked. But nevertheless, that fly must have been a Buddhist because he did the old ceremony of circumambulating my mouth three times, which is what we do on our Buddhist holy days. <laughs> holy days, go around three times. And that fly did that. Then it went. So when you don't control, you can get some wonderful fun and games. And it wasn't that irritating. It was fine. It didn't last. So you go into those feelings and it becomes automatic. You're just sitting there watching without doing anything at all, being a, just a really passive observer of whatever is occurring. And of course, what happens then is you, things vanish and disappear and you get very peaceful and still. I wanted to tell the story, uh, I, I promise this, so I have to keep my promises, of what Ajahn Chai used to tell me. And this was a story he told me, he actually told all the monks. When I first came to, to Thailand, he repeated a story you know, quite a few times, again and again and again, then he moved on to another story. He never came back to this story. When I first heard it, I rejected it. I thought, this is stupid, this is not right, this can't be right. It's only later on in my life as a monk, when I came back to the story, I just remembered it and I thought, wow, the only reason I rejected it because I wasn't sort of advanced enough in my meditation to appreciate it. And then once I remembered it again, it was to me, it was one of those beautiful anecdotes about how to meditate, how to get childless, how to become enlightened. And that's why I share with people, many of you may sort of just reject it. It's incredibly accurate. And the other thing about it was that it was about four or five years after he told the story that I remembered it again. This was amazing. It wasn't in any book. No one sort of uh, triggered the memory to me. In fact, a lot of, most people have forgotten it. But it's like that when you hear good teachings, and sometimes very deep teachings, they stay inside you somewhere. They stay inside you just waiting. Waiting for the moment when they can really be of assistance to you. Just like here in Australia, in the middle of Australia in the desert, there's some of the seeds that go in the ground and they stay in the ground for years and years and years. And when there's the, the rainstorm, which doesn't come every day, but you know, every few years, when there's the right conditions every few years, then those little seedlings germinate and these flowers come up all over the middle of the Australian desert. 
just for a few days. And of course, then they pollinate and they create more seeds and the seeds go back into the sand and stay there just waiting, waiting for the right time and place to blossom again. And this, that's like some great teachings. This is one of them that just, it just emerged. I said, hey, Ajahn Chah said that. And you were ready to understand it. And that was the simile of the mangoes. The Ajahn Chah said that his monastery, Wat Pa Pa, was a mango orchard where the trees were planted by the Buddha himself. Now remember that you know, I was educated at Cambridge. I was a physicist. Logic was important to me, evidence-based, all that sort of stuff. I said, this is crazy. The Buddha never came to that part of Thailand. There are no mango trees here. But anyway, Ajahn Chah continued that those mango trees were planted by the Buddha himself. And he said that now, two and a half thousand years later, okay, now all those mango trees are so healthy. And all those mango trees are so many mangoes on them. The most juicy, delicious, sweet mangoes you could imagine. But Ajahn Chah said, you cannot climb the tree to get any of those mangoes. You can't go that high. You cannot so shake the tree to make the mangoes fall. You cannot throw sticks up to get the mangoes to come down. The ladder will not reach them. There's only one way you can get the mangoes, sweet and juicy, on the trees planted by the Buddha. And that way is to sit perfectly still underneath a mango tree and hold out your hand. And if you hold out your hand sitting perfectly still, a mango will fall right into your hand for you to enjoy. To me, that made no sense at all. Until later on, you realize that if you can learn how to sit perfectly still, you don't need to do things, to strive, to struggle, to make things happen to make resolutions or determinations, oh, my experience, these states or those states, that really gets you in the way, gets you, the doer, the being, the self, which was supposed to be realized, it doesn't exist anyway. That gets that in the way of meditation and you're wasting time. But to be able to let go, renounce, give up, let go, you get more and more still, you're sitting there just perfectly still. Nothing moving. Everything being totally automatic. It's like when I was saying when you were walking, I wasn't doing the walking. The body knew how to do the walking. I was just watching. Being this wonderful passive observer. You're just fully aware. Kind. Feeling so safe. You don't need to do anything or go anywhere or, or protect anything. And then that kindness, that's the stillness, the kindness. It's like opening up your hand. When you have the kindness and the stillness, all these mangoes fall. They fall right into the center of your hand. Softly, and you can enjoy them. These are not just nimitas and they're jhanas. They're enlightenment factors. They're stages of enlightenment. You don't do anything. You can't do anything. Enlightenment is not an attainment. It's not something you gain. It's what happens when you disappear. This idea of non-self is just fundamental to the past. It's not just you know, what you experience, it's just what happens. You vanish, you disappear. Beautiful, blissful experiences, just they fall right into your hand. And of course, by this time, there's no fear or dread left at all, because it's just so blissful, so wonderful. And they all those bliss states, they just have the, the taste of freedom. It's the word the Buddha used, the taste of freedom. When you experience these things afterwards, when you look back upon them, you say, well, that was just so gorgeous. So profound as well. It's not just a bliss for the sake of indulging in some sort of pleasure. It's a bliss which is just redolent. It's just soaked with meaning, with dhamma, with insights. These aren't insights which you work out by 
the logic or by inference. This means that, that means that. This is something which you see and feel. You feel the freedom. You don't need to have an insight into it. It's right there in front of you. You can touch it, you're in it, you're living it, you're with it, it's just around you. And that sort of freedom. Freedom from all the wants and desires. What we're saying this afternoon with contentment, this is big contentment. Contentment which just, when you come out afterwards, some of these things just make your tears come out. Not without obviously upset or anything, just with bliss. This which we express, just with, with crying, beautiful stuff, with a huge smile on your face. And often that lasts even with a jhana for days. So happy, so at peace. And that increases your health enormously. And sometimes the health conditions, just, they can't stand that sort of um, problem. They can't sort of stand that type of bliss. Again, I'm not quite sure exactly physiologically how it works, and I'd love to do some experiments on that, but a bit old now. But just to be able to, to experience just the energies which come into your body when you emerge out of, out of the meditation, the power of those states is huge. And how do you feel them? Oh, it's like you have all your... Every atom in your body has been washed clean. Every sort of connection has been just uh, like you've just been sat and it's like you just had a great sort of tune up of your car and it just your car just or vehicle just runs just powerfully free of any, any, any uh, problem. You may have had a problem before, a disease. It's kind of gone. Seen that too many times to doubt it. And not only that, you have this beautiful sense of your sense of self vanishing, who you thought you were. And all the problems we had when people criticize us, feeling we're not good enough, feeling that we're tremendous, all that relating to the world with the sense of I and me and mine has disappeared. So the praise and blame just doesn't even reach you. Not only that, but all your possessions, all the things you own, yeah, if they disappear, that's fine. You know, just, what was it, a couple of months ago, we had a burglar came through our monastery and uh, opened the donation box. Actually, it's more than two months now, it's about three months, and stole stuff from the donation box. And I told all the monks, as I tell everybody, Burglar can steal money, but never let them steal your compassion, your kindness, your peace, your forgiveness. The most important things in life, you don't have to let people steal. The most important things in life are those beautiful states of mind, the peace, the happiness, the kindness. When people criticize you, imagine being dressed like this going in a Western world. I've been criticized so much by people, just even the way I dress. <laughs> you're dressed like a girl that was in the old days but anyway this whole criticism which you get is just, what does it mean who are you criticizing who are you criticizing you're criticizing my body can't much, do much about it, I'm getting old are you criticizing my perception my feelings, my perceptions my sankharas, my consciousnesses just a process that's all, nothing to Criticize, nothing to praise. Who are you praising? Well, I don't know. Because when you start to disappear and you lose your sense of self and identity, you've got nothing left to prove, nothing left to own or keep. So if there are any attainments, in inverted commas, it's like medals. You've got no place to put the medal on. There's no jacket <coughs> on which to... to to click the button to get the, the attainment on. There's no little hat which you can show that you're a sergeant or, or a, a major or a general. All those things which people fight for and, and cling to and just aspire to. You see just how meaningless they all are. You let them all go and you're free. 
like a bird, a bird who flies through the air with only the weight of their wings as their burden. Never see any birds with suitcases when they migrate from country to country. They never have any, any passports, they don't even need COVID injections of uh, vaccines to fly from place to place. It's this great sense of like freedom there. So often I look at the birds in the sky, see them soaring up there and feeling that you can be the same. You have no weight, nothing to burden you, no possessions. And being a monk like that, it's amazing just how much food people give me. <laughs> Even today, I can't help but sharing these little silly stories as well as the refined stories. For my lunch today, guess what people bought me for lunch? Just you know, before uh, 12 o'clock at 11 a.m. over here. Fish and chips. <laughs> they brought me fish and chips for my lunch. <laughs> Never asked for it. It just sort of arrived. People are so kind that I give some kindness to them and they'll always give kindness back. You serve them and I'll always be served back. I don't need to protect anything. I don't need to worry about a thing. You have this wonderful sense that the more you let go, the more you give out, the more you vanish, the more safe you are. The food, it will come when I need it. Medicines, when I need it, will come. I don't need very much. Which means just how peaceful and how blissful, how beautiful life can be. Sometimes I feel more free than a bird. The bird has still got the weight of its body. But in meditation, you've got no weight at all. Nothing to hold you down or hold you back. You just soar, weightless, free, not wanting anything in the whole world. Nothing holding you back, free disappearing into the bliss of emptiness, of stillness and freedom. Bliss upon bliss upon bliss. Whew. That's the 30 minutes I'm supposed to do a guided meditation afterwards. So please excuse me for indulging. I can't, I can't stop, I just really enjoy <laughs> this sort of stuff. So there we go. So do we need to have a break before we do the loving kindness meditation or just go straight into it? Let's go straight into it. Okay, this is a guided loving kindness meditation. When we finish, I'll give a blessing and then there's a bit of a discussion or Q&A or something. I leave that up to uh, Venerable Chandler to decide. But this is like a guided loving kindness meditation. And thank you for letting me to do this do, letting me do this straight after the talk because you know, you're in the mood. So for loving kindness meditation, uh, I'm going to I'm not going to do the the um, the cat similarly this time. I'm going to do another type of loving kindness meditation, which is also really beautiful. <sighs> so I just first of all close my eyes and relax to the max. Feeling really peaceful in my body, my poor old body. So I've done a lot of work today. It's coming towards the end of the day for me. So I thank you, body. I show some gratitude towards it. My body's 69 years and it's still pretty healthy and allows me to do what I want it to do. It doesn't really get sick at all. It's, it's really been a good deal this body. I've had a car for 69 years and it hardly ever needs to get a service or nothing goes wrong with it, it doesn't break down, it doesn't crash. Now, I don't think I've ever broken a bone in my body. I've always managed to sort of, sometimes I thought I've had falling off ladders and stuff, but the body's just really good, strong. Thank you, body. And I give that gratitude to my body. So my body sort of smiles back. This is just a metaphor. It feels, thank you for looking after me. I'll look after you. And I ask my body with real sincerity, not just as a method or something to do, 
but just with truth. I care for your body. Not caring to get something out of you, but just caring, expecting nothing back in return. My body just relaxes just so deeply. And once it starts to relax, it just carries on relaxing. Again, it does it by itself. I don't need to sort of stand over it like some foreman at a building site saying, come on, relax, you're not relaxing enough, come on. Never like that, just this beautiful kindness. Take your time, body. Legs, butt, how are you all? And everything just gets so at ease, so at peace. Just like it is the summertime and you're on some deck chair recliner, just in some quiet resort somewhere. You're just relaxing. And the sun is just, just right, not too warm, not too cold. It allows you, and it's so safe, so peaceful. Nothing to disturb you at all. If you have any health problems, this is the most wonderful way to heal the body. Any emotional problems all come from that tightness in the mind. Everything is being loosened up. So loose, so free. Think of the word freedom. Not the freedom of desire, the freedom from desire. You don't want anything in the whole world. Desire just leaves you, allows you to be content and at peace right now. Kind to your body. Kind to your mind. Your poor mind often does striving during a meditation retreat. All these goals you're trying to attain, and all the disappointments you find, oh, why did that happen? Now just forgive your mind. Forgive your mind if it hasn't done the practice of being <coughs> wasting time or anything. Mind, you're okay. We're all learning. So be kind to your mind. Forgive it all its faults. Sometimes even with a mind, it's like looking at a wall with two bad bricks. You think your mind is not up to scratch. You just see the two bad bricks. Your faults. But then through this meditation, maybe through some trust, in the monks and nuns teachings, you realize that you, your mind, is much bigger than a little mistake, or even, even bigger than a big mistake. You see the good, beautiful bricks in the wall which makes your mind up. And you start to feel at peace with your mind. It's learning, it's growing. with that kindness towards your mind. There's beautiful peace coming up. I am all right. There's nothing which I need to fix in me. Or change. Or alter at all. Your loving kindness embraces you. Precisely as you are. It's like a mother sees way beyond the faults of their child. Just loves them to bits the way they are. Like a disabled man whose arm was deformed came to the monastery yesterday, gave as much love and care as he possibly could, where so many others rejected him. 
I give the loving kindness to my own mind, which is not perfect. That's all sorts of mistakes, deformities, whatever you might call it. I love my mind. I love my body. This beautiful loving kindness embraces, embraces the truth of my body and mind right now. And each one of you practicing this, the very fact that you're on a retreat, the fact that you are meditating, to me, that means you're really advanced. You're beautiful people. I've known many of you, some for years, some only for a short time. But really impressed. Impressed in the quality. All the people listening to this talk today. I had to, you know, have to have made some good karma somewhere. To be able to have the privilege of listening to good dharma and practicing it. Well done. Let's so have gratitude to your own body and mind. You have loving kindness to it. And you say more than I can ever say. You say to your own body and mind, body and mind, the door of my heart is open to you. You mean it. All of you can come inside and find peace and respect. Sometimes we don't understand what we sometimes think of as faults. This evening, looking at the sunset from my hut, which is quite a ways away from the, the ocean. But it's high up, so I can see the ocean. Sunsets are most beautiful when there's a bit of cloud or smoke on the horizon. It causes the sun to spread its golden red yellow colors over the horizon. If there were no clouds, no dust, no smoke, the sunset would never be as beautiful. So you, the one listening to this, don't try and get rid of all the dust and the smoke and the clouds in your life. That's what makes you beautiful. Embrace it with love and kindness. The door of my heart is open to me as I am. With all the faults and all the beauty too. As you imagine this loving kindness acceptance, making peace, going all around you, all around you and soaking in. You may have some resistance to some corners of your body, some parts of your life, but let it soak in. Let it melt those, those hard, icy parts of your past. Let just soften with all the judgmental things you have about your future. So the whole past and future, which makes up you, can just get so softened and blissed out and drenched with this beautiful golden glow of loving kindness, making peace with your past making peace with your future, giving love to this moment. As you appreciate this present moment, you feel the energy building up, beautiful golden energy. If your meditation has been going well, who knows, you might see like what we call metta nimitta side of a mind which is being imbued with loving kindness. Which for most people it's just beautiful golden light. You can't actually see it inside your mind, feel it, imagine it, 
pure golden healing light of love inside of you. Imagine it getting bigger and bigger till it goes out out of the little area you're sitting in to people in the same house or the same street as you or maybe a cat or a dog in your house. If your loving kindness gets very strong, animals can feel it so easily. Send a still, peaceful, powerful, golden light further afield. It's called like the spreading of loving kindness. In your house, or maybe neighbors, or cat, dog, or whatever. Imagine that. You're sharing this beautiful love and kindness and acceptance and warmth to the beings in your house. By the golden light of loving kindness, it's coming out of your body and mind and bathing them. They need that as much as you do. You're supplying the energy, the peace, the power. And you're soaking them up and down. You're giving, expecting nothing back in return. You find the more you give like that, the more energy you have to give. It's like it just magnifies. So your energy gets so wonderful, so great. Even your house, your home, your flat cannot contain it. It goes out through the walls, through the roof, all the people in the street or in the neighborhood. I often imagine visualize like this golden light spreading, spreading through the neighborhood. And as it spreads, it doesn't get weaker, it gets stronger, more intense. The door of my heart is open to all the flies. Ants, snakes, birds, monks, lay people, everybody in this monastery. This is my reflection. May all living beings in this monastery, all the grass and the flowers and the trees, beings in the ground, beings up in the air, may all beings. Take all of my happiness and joy and peace and bliss. The more I give, the more I have left to give. It's not a zero sum game, loving kindness. It just motivates, multiplies. Giving all this loving kindness to all the beings in the forest, all the beings in your neighborhood. We keep expanding it. All the beings in UK. You know that some of those beings are your parents and friends, wives, husbands, sisters, whatever. You really spread it out. Can you imagine this in the country in which you live? It could be Poland, the United States, or even in Australia. Beautiful loving kindness spreading out wide, healing. My goodness, people need this energy, this power. In times of COVID and depressions and desperations and wars and disappointments. What a wonderful gift this is you can give to all beings. Kindness, fearlessness energy, healing, however you visualize it or feel it, spreading this loving kindness over the whole world, not just for people or beings, but for the earth, for all of the flowers, plants, even bacteria, fungus, whatever it is, which makes up this earth, the rivers, the mountains, the seas, the oceans, even the wind, 
May the wind be gentle and caring for life. Spread this love and kindness over the whole planet Earth. It's cold and close, stronger and more powerful. Healing, inspiring. After a while, it does become an automatic process. It's kind of just watching it. It happens by itself. Joy, giving, the healing. You notice that's nothing to do with you. It's for all. May all beings be happy and well. It includes you. It doesn't come from you. May all beings be at peace. Still happy. <coughs> Just stay there for a while. As you soak in loving kindness, it comes into your body and mind. It goes out towards others. You're part of this process, not a part, but right within it. Enjoy the joy, peace, the bliss of giving. I will be quiet for about two or three minutes. And then I will end the loving kindness meditation in about three minutes time with a little blessing chant for you all in about three or four minutes.
here comes the blessing. Simpali, so well wishing to all of you, to your happiness, to your peace, to your health, and your ability to share all these with others. Sabaroga Vidimoto Sabasanta Pawajito Sabawera Matigando Nibuto Chatuan Bawa Sabiti Oviwa Chantu Sabarogo Vinasatu Mate Bawan Wantarayo Suki Digayu Gopawa Api Wadan Hasi Ritsanichan Uta Chang Dino full of joy and happiness in whatever you do in your life. Hey. <laughs> Thank you for letting me to enjoy that. This is a great job being a monk. <laughs> you get huge job satisfaction. <laughs> a lot of bliss. The pay is hopeless. <laughs> Don't get any pay. Totally exploited. But anyway, the retirement benefits are out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll be quiet for a while now. What happens next? Chanda. So I would like to first thank you, Ajahn, for being with us and for imparting your wisdom infused with so much loving kindness and um, I hope that like myself everyone here has really really benefited from your teachings and it's a real privilege to be able to share um, what I've experienced through learning from you with others as well so thank you so much for agreeing to do this retreat and for being such a wonderful guide to me personally and hopefully to many others who are here today and just instilling that love for the Dhamma in us and also a deeper understanding for the Buddha's teachings. So words fail really, but um, <laughs> basically a heartfelt gratitude for, yeah. on behalf of everybody here. And I also would like to thank the team who have been so patiently and um, efficiently helping to ensure that this runs very smoothly and not only with the technical side but I feel that you've been caring for the retreatants and I've received some messages of thanks to you from some of them who say just what wonderful people the co-hosts are and how lovely it's been to um, be looked after by all of you so obviously for me that's helped enormously um, and yeah just to to let people know so even it might not look as though they're doing so much behind the scene, but you've actually been uh, fundamental in helping this be a really safe space and a protected space. And um, everything has run technically very, very well indeed. So a big thank you to the team. And I would like to invite one of the team now, Anne-Marie, who's very bravely and kindly offered to say a few words about the practice of generosity. So she'll do that. And after that, Ajahn, um, yeah. we'll have some discussion about Anukampa, about what it's about, and maybe how you might like to be involved. So I'll hand back over to you after that, Ajahn, to say a few okay. more. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, whenever, yeah. Great. So, Anne Marie. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Venerable? Great, perfect. Be before I do that, if we're in the spirit of thanking the team, I would also like to do a little shout out to the, um, the team behind the scenes who've been so diligently and so quickly upload recording, uploading all the recordings onto the um, uh. YouTube channel because they're also part of the team. Um, so yeah, thank you. And I'd like to offer a few words about um, the Buddhist practice of dana, which uh, means generosity in Pali. And it refers to um, both the act of giving as, as well as the donation itself. Now, the, the Buddha teaches that dana is a very important part of our spiritual path and even serving as the foundation of our practice and can help us to let go of our, it can help us to let go of some of our self-interest and cultivate a mind of joy, loving kindness, uh, compassion. And um, there are many ways to practice generosity. Like this morning, Arjun spoke so beautifully about giving ourselves in meditation and the practice of giving to the moment or the gift of peace and caring for our body and mind. Um, and Buddhist monastics also practice generosity through sharing the Dhamma. And this offers those who value this um, an opportunity to practice generosity by providing for their material needs. Now, as most of you know, this retreat is organized in support of Anukampa Bikuni project. And the aim of this project is to um, both share the teachings and the practices of early Buddhism, as well as to establish the first monastery in the UK where women can train towards the full Bikuni ordination. And the aim for the monastery is um, to be located somewhere in the beautiful English countryside, but also in an accessible place and it will equally be a place for anyone of um, any color, any gender, age, or sexual orientation who wishes to deepen their practice and who could come and stay to um, experience the monastic lifestyle firsthand. Um, and it will also be a place to uh, come on retreats as well. And those retreats would also be offered in the spirit of generosity and they should be accessible to everyone. And also nobody uh, would ever be obliged to donate um, and even if there was a registration fee to secure a place for example um, then Anukampa will always aim to have a bursary fund for those who may need it at that point in time. Now all the generous work that is going into the project um, by Venerable Chanda most of all, um, Ajahn Brahm, the project team as well as the wider community um, and that very much includes all of us here today um, sharing our practice together. Um, all that work uh, contributes to putting the conditions in place that are needed to, um, to realize the vision uh, for the monastery. And a significant part of this uh, are also the financial contributions uh, from those who feel moved and are able to donate in that way. And we invite all of those to give with a heart of generosity uh, whilst being considerate of your personal means. Um, and in the practice of dana, the volition or the intention with which one gives uh, is what counts the most and the amount is less important or or maybe not at all. Um, now the registration fee from this retreat uh, will go towards the rental expenses of the residents in Oxford where Venerable Chanda is uh, residing at the moment and all other donations from this retreat will be used for the purchase and the development um, of the monastery. Now for those of you who would like to make a contribution. Um, Mel has just put the um, website link in the chat box. For those listening on the live stream, um, you can find more information on anukampaproject.org forward slash donate. And it's also possible and especially helpful for the project to set up a standing order. Um, that way you get the opportunity to um, develop your generosity a little bit every month. Um, and one final note is that uh, Anukampa is a UK charity, so for those who pay tax in the UK, that means that you can also claim gift aid on your donation. So I thank you very much for your attention, uh, even more so for your participation in the retreat uh, over the last six days. Uh, I think I can speak for all of uh, the team that it's been a joy and an honour to um, share this time together. So thank you.
Thank okay. you very much, Anne-Marie. So, we were going to say a few more words about the project and um, why Adrian Bram's supporting it and what he hopes to um, help us with over here in the UK and perhaps why this is so necessary. Um, and also, I think, since we have 25 minutes, if people do want to ask any questions about that, then you're welcome to. We will also have a whole hour with me after that for those who wish to have the follow up and more casual chat. But for now, let's just see how it goes. So Ajahn Brown may start and I may add something too. Yeah. So. Uh, this is my, my life. This is my 47th year as a monk in the Brown Robes. I haven't completed 47 yet. 46 and a bit. But all the things which I look back on, you got your own meditation and insights and stuff. But a monk, doesn't matter how senior, always has to be giving. And it's a joy to give. And all the things of projects which I have managed over those years. And you start off with. Uh, building monasteries, but try and building monasteries which are comfortable, which are kind. I even said today to somebody that the first rule in our monastic rules, this is apart from the rule set down by the Buddha, is always be compassionate. So that rule is the most important rule in Bodhinyana monastery, to be kind. Because from that kindness, all the other rules fall into place. And to be able to spread that kindness, not just to a monastery of male monks, but to spread that to Dhammasara Nuns Monastery, which we built so many years ago now. And I look at that place and it's just such a beautiful place. This is our monastery for bhikkhunis in Perth. 583 acres, I think it is. A beautiful monastery. That's about the size of the Vatican, by the way. <laughs> Those of you want to know its size. I don't think the big hoodies in Dhammasar have got those aspirations to be as big as the Vatican. Because sometimes too much power corrupts. But we don't like sort of having powerful, big organisations. We like to build something like uh, Dhammasar and just and give it to the big hoodies and off you go. Let you be free and kind and there's so many things which I will never understand and never know. And so you won't be able to do this much better than I can. So now it's just uh, one of the projects now is just to have a beautiful nuns monastery over in England. We have one over in Australia, one in UK. This, this is my homeland where I was born, where I learned my Dhamma, you know, first of all. I do feel a sense of obligation there. And of course, you know, you know that 11 years ago when we did the bhikkhuni ordination, it did cause a lot of pain. I apologize for that, but there's the only way you could do it uh, for many people over in UK. And I feel an obligation also to heal that pain and to actually to have a very thriving nuns monastery, bhikkhuni monastery in UK. And of course, it's, it's going to happen. I can see. I don't plan the future, but it's an obvious thing which was going to happen to have this beautiful place where bhikkhunis can live as peacefully, as respectedly, and be able to give these beautiful teachings to others. The Buddhism is not a misogynist religion. It is not patriarchal. It is just not the leader of Buddhism is compassion and kindness. And little by little, we create these possibilities. It takes a time, but we're patient. That's the one thing about Buddhists. But because we believe in reincarnation, rebirth, we're just so, so patient. So already we're going to get there. It's just a matter of time. And then we can see this beautiful, you can imagine it just almost like closing your eyes and imagining in some beautiful hillside or valley over in UK somewhere. You go in the gate, and it's not monks there, it's bhikkhunis, fully ordained bhikkhunis, just like in the time of the Buddha. 
and you see them just young ones just training to become bhikkhunis you see them the seminaries the bhikkhunis the senior bhikkhunis you can see them teaching you can see them meditating you can see them <laughs> i'm fantasizing now being interviewed by the bbc with respect and honor the first bhikkhuni monastery in the uk and then you know as i would know that somehow or other i was part of it even though i'm not a bhikkhuni i'm just a monk but you're part of it making this happen in our own way being a contributor i contribute my time energy loving kindness whatever i can give you give and i say the more you give the more you have to offer as a little by little you see what the future will lie. I'm not quite sure where that will be in the UK. It's already gone way past the point where you just say, no, it's not going to happen. You don't know, it may not be Venerable Chanda in charge of it. Maybe she goes off on a retreat. Someone has a nice little time with it. It's already just got too much effort and energy and just momentum to stop. It's only been paused because of COVID. But even that gives an opportunity to strengthen our base and in the future you see this beautiful monastery a beautiful monastery for nuns for women because there's many things where i can teach so much but there's some things i cannot teach i realize that and there's some things which the kuni chanda can teach which i can't teach and little by little this project will grow and it's wonderful to know that you are a part of it. Whatever way you've contributed, they're helping on the committees, helping just to raise funds to clean up, to feed the bikunis, to look after them in so many different ways to help and volunteer. And it's not that it's not that we need you. It's that you need to be part of this that you need to be able to aspire to some amazing project. The first Bikuni project in UK. The first, the very first. And then at the end of your days, when you look back at how you lived your life, what have you done? He said, I built a monastery for Bikunis. Something they said could never happen. Some of those said would never happen, but you didn't believe in that. You followed your heart, you followed the inspiration, and there it is. Even the place where I live, Bodhinyana Monastery. You know, many people thought there would be no way we could build open a monastery for monks over here in Australia. This is a, it's not the central part of Australia. This is you know, the west of Australia, it's a backwater of Australia. But nevertheless, this incredibly beautiful, powerful monastery here. Why on earth can we have one like this for women in England? There's no reason why not. So it's going to happen. So we all need, in whichever way we can, small, big, interesting ways to be able to give, to give our hearts our energy, our effort, to something much greater than ourselves. It's a beautiful monastery for women. They've got so many monasteries for monks in the UK. I'm a monk myself, I can say this. Because we've got too much. So now we can give back. Give back to bhikkhunis. Just like in the time of the Buddha. And it's an honour to serve. It's not a burden. Just give me more to do. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I'd just like to also add to that by saying that um, this monastery will very much be your monastery. You know, it won't belong to anyone in particular. We do have a very um, uh, not tight 
carefully worded constitution to ensure that it will always be run by the bhikkhuni sangha so it will not be a place which can be overtaken by monks which sometimes has happened even with ayak mas monastery which mm. she established in australia you know they did something there in the constitution that must have left a way in for it to be uh taken over by monks in later years but we've made ours very very carefully so that this will remain for bikunis and for women to to take the full ordination which doesn't mean that anyone's excluded because the lay community of any gender can also be a part of this but it does mean that there'll be women in leadership roles and there'll be perhaps like ajan says there's always going to be a slightly different angle that someone from any gender can bring someone from any personality any background can bring we're all individuals and so everyone has something to offer but i think you know for women it can be very empowering to have our own space and to feel our own way into our lineage and into our inheritance from the buddha because this is the buddha's gift to us this isn't something that ajahn brahm has decided we should have or that any monk or even any bhikkhuni has decided that we we deserve this was something laid down by the buddha from the beginning fairly close to the beginning of his teachings and he said in the mahaparinibbana sutta that he wouldn't pass away into the parinibbana the final laying down of his body and mind until the four fold assembly was established and was wise and that four fold assembly was the assembly of lay men women and gender non binary people which i'm sure did exist at that time and also the bikkhus and the bikkhuni sangha so this was his intention from the start so by doing this we're not only you know helping strengthen buddhism for women but we're helping strengthen the fourfold assembly for the sake of the future of buddhism for all and the other thing i wanted to say is that yesterday someone said that they hadn't heard a lot uh, of teachers discussing the gradual training and especially things like mental um virtue so the virtue of the mind which we call indriya samvara sila um guarding of the senses or sense restraint and i think a monastery is very special place in that it's the middle it's it's actually a possibility to integrate your practice into daily life so every day will involve some solitude some time for practice meditation formal sitting and some service to the community of which you are part so this is very different from being either fully engaged in our work life fully engaged in a job or career or family or going to a retreat center and being 100% on retreat in meditation and yesterday also somebody said that they sometimes had a, a they had a difficulty coming out of a very long intensive retreat um because they were very sensitive and it took a long time to feel sort of balanced and adjusted again to the kind of speed and busyness of ordinary life and a monastery is a place to learn how to integrate that how to integrate the teachings of meditation into your daily activities and how to how service can you know contribute to the practice and help get you on the right path as ajahn brahm's been saying for the last 7 days and hopefully i've been also teaching along the same lines that giving is such an important part of the momentum of practice you know rather than practicing to get and to gain we actually practice to give to give things away yeah to relinquish to be generous to be kind so being in a spiritual community can be a very powerful way to um to strengthen that practice you're around like-minded people you know and spiritual friendship is the whole of the holy life So that doesn't only mean for monks and nuns that also can mean for the lay community spiritual friendship is everything because we keep each other on the path and we can inspire each other through our practice to walk more deeply than we could walk alone so so um so i would very much love for everybody to get involved in whatever way they can if that's coming to our retreats or coming to visit the monastery in the future or getting involved even at this stage you could send uh, you could visit me and offer food or when covid finishes of course we can again have some guests um and at the moment i'm just in a small house in oxford it's a four bedroom terrace house 
Um, it's a shame really that the, most of the rooms have been empty for the last nine months. Um, but still, it's like a little powerhouse of Dhamma service because from here I organize all the retreats and also have some regular um, sessions of my own like every week. We have a couple of um, Dhamma teachings online. So you may feel inspired to join some of those regular teachings also if you wish. And uh, yeah, in the long run, I hope that I'll be able to invite you to this beautiful, magical place in the English hills, somewhere in the countryside that's uh, not too hard to get to, and yet that offers a space of solitude and quiet and a feeling that you can really get away from the world for some time. So I really look forward to that time and we can meet again and practice together there. So I think that's uh, pretty much all I have to say. And as I said, we can have some discussion later on, but perhaps Ajahn would like to say a few more words or perhaps people have questions or comments that they'd like to share, so. Maybe let other people speak as well with their comments and suggestions. It's an inspiring thing to do, to create something which has to be created before in UK. Yeah. So, since this is very much on the spur of the moment, I would suggest, uh, could possibly ask Anne-Marie what she thinks would be a good way. Should we ask them to use the participants button and raise the blue hand? Yeah. So if you wanted to uh, say or share or any feedback, it doesn't have to be about the project, it can be about the retreat or you might want to express anything at all. The door of our ears is open. <laughs> so there's a little participants button at the bottom and if you press on that I do believe that there should be a way to stick up a little uh, hand on your screen and you can speak but actually they'll be on live because we're still recording this so if you want me to ask you a question you can put it in you can just write it straight to me or you can turn off your video before you speak okay that's a lot of instructions, isn't it? <laughs> but I do have to say that you'll be on, you know, we're still being recorded. So if that makes you feel shy, please turn off your video or send me your question. It's also a great opportunity to speak to Ajahn Brown. Some of you might not have met him before. Venerable, may I? Yeah. Hi, I just, thank you. I, I can't put my blue hand up as the host. So I just wanted to offer so much gratitude to you, Venerable, and to Arjun Brahm. It's been such a privilege and a pleasure to, to be in this virtual room with you for a week. It's uh, almost like we were close and, and in closer proximity. I really felt felt the strength of the the, the collective Dharma here. It's it's I feel really moved by the words I've just heard. And I have some gratitude coming in from people into my inbox from the community saying they have no questions, but only thanks and gratitude to pass on to you. So uh, on behalf of them and myself, thank you both so much. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. I have a message saying that perhaps Tess would like to speak. Is that the case, Tess? No. OK. Uh, let's have a look. <laughs> you do? Hard to tell. No, you don't. Okay. <laughs> but I have a message that Piotr would like to speak and he doesn't know how uh, to raise the blue hand. So maybe we can unmute Piotr. Okay. Okay. I think I unmuted. Yep. You hear me? Okay. So uh, first of all, of course, uh, it was a great retreat and a lot of great teaching. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, I'm really like uh, happy that such retreats happen because there is so much atmosphere of love and and this light side of the path uh, with all these uh, positive qualities. And I think that's great that it's growing. And of course, I want to support this with all my heart and finances and all. I just would like to share one thing that uh, I think would greatly like the improvement for me at least as for retreats um, because I feel like only one thing is lacking and that thing is um, 
lack of uh, possibility of private conversations with uh, monastics. So if uh, you are too busy to um, do these conversations, then perhaps uh, you could uh, get some another bhikkhu or bhikkhuni who could be like available for participants to have possibility of private conversation. Because I remember that when I was on a retreat with Ajahn Sujato in Slovakia and there was possibility to have an uh, interview with him every day and it was one of the most um, uh, wholesome things that in my life happened. That um, it really helps a lot this emotional contact and private conversation when you know you can say anything and get feedback. You can talk about your experiences. Uh, without feeling that you are uh, sharing too much about your uh, practice or something. So I think this is very important. And um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of people could benefit from it. And I think this is the only thing that um, is uh, could be improved because uh, the QA sessions are very good uh, to answer like um, easier questions, but to get really in-depth conversation, I think there is um, this private conversation with any big or big kuni could be great. And I think that uh, it would be very good because, um, well, when someone is deeper on the path, then uh, not much people can understand you on these deeper aspects of consciousness, what's going on. And uh, a lot of people in countries like Poland, when we don't have a monastery or any big or big kuni, we miss a lot like, um, this opportunity to talk with someone who could understand these deeper aspects of reality that is unique to Buddhism. So I think uh, okay. if there could be uh, such possibility to consider, I would be very grateful and I hope others as well. And uh, aside from that, everything is really great and I, I will uh, try to share and encourage people to donate and, uh, and of course I'm up for more retreats. Thank you, Venerable, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, this is all part of why we want to develop the Sangha in England, because right now we're doing so much. And if we would do also the personal question, I think for me, I'd be only be able to do about a two day retreat. So it's a balancing act. But this is, you know, clearly why we need more monastic Sangha, isn't it? So we have to work it from the ground up. I think that would be my answer. So um, and in time, you know, of course, this is a Zoom retreat as well. If you can have a personal retreat, it's a very different thing. And also if you can have a smaller retreat, but that's what the monastery would aim to accomplish, you know. And I think the other thing about having an established monastery is that you have the opportunity to create a relationship with a teacher over years. And there can be nothing that compares with that. You know, a retreat is just like a first meeting point, but to have ongoing relationships with members of the Sangha or someone who you take to be your teacher is something that really can't be beaten. So this is all part of our aim with the monastery project as well. Thank you for that feedback. Um, and there's another question that's just come in, I think, from Leela, maybe. I'm not sure if I have your question, Leela. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So can you take a, a general Dhamma question, Ajahn? Certainly. Okay. So yesterday, when you spoke about Atman and the Buddha splitting the uh -huh. Atman oh, yeah. <laughs> with the simile of Rutherford splitting the atom, it really struck me. It was all I could think about all day. Could you please <laughs> say a bit more about this? Because I feel it would help me so much. I've read classical descriptions of Atman, but never really got what it is. It is just the why that they have the idea of an atom. They always want to reduce uh, something to its essential particles. And basically there is no essential particle in physics. They split the atom and then they, so the, the old uh, electrons, and neutrons, protons, and they split them up. And they keep splitting things up until they can't split things up anymore. And you have this like dance of particles. And sometimes it's missing the point. But the missing point is this answer of things, it's a relationship between things. 
And the things don't exist without that relationship with what they call the forces of nature. And it's the same with the idea of your sense of who are you? And as we sort of reflect on who we are, we don't get sort of uh, stuck in notions of, of some God or some cosmic consciousness or some essence. You see that we're always in relationship with the surroundings, with the people we meet, you know, with our own experiences. And little by little, we just penetrate that as we become more and more still, more and more peaceful. So we have personal experience of what is our body and mind. When we find out there's some parts of us, which I don't know why we kept on clinging on to, they cause us so much pain and suffering. Just the reason I just because I was, uh, had to go down at six o'clock our time. That was, was that uh, uh, 10 o'clock your time? That I had to go down because again, somebody else had passed away. So I had to get the, the ashes and stuff already. So that why do people worry about things like death? It's, it's not so much of our, our body disappearing and dying. It's just what we've done before we died relationship we had to our world, to our friends, what we gave, how we lived. That's more important than this little thing called a vehicle, called a body, but still people attach to their body so much. We attach to our experiences, attached to our perceptions, attached to our will, that's a fourth of the five candidates, and attached to our consciousnesses, rather than just allowing them to disappear. Like how we can let our body go. Why can't we let our mind go as well? A little by little, we have a marvelous relationship with our body and mind, serving, giving, until it all vanishes. Why not? It's the relationships which is important, not the things. Great. We have a question um, up from Alexandra. Alexandra has her hand up, and I think that means she'd like yeah. to ask it personally. So please. Uh, okay. Do that, Alexandra, and then maybe one more if you have energy, Ajahn. Yeah, I do notice that this time I'm getting close to my bedtime, so I, I know. Get tired. My brain just, my brain is still pretty clear, but it does start to feel that it's not getting as sharp as it is in the early morning. So please, Alexandra, what question have you got? Can't see Alexandra. She's being unmuted, I think. If she still wants to ask, is it working? So, Alexandra, um, I think the co ah, yeah, there you, there you are. Yes. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> thank you. It's not a question. It's just both to you, Venerable, and to Ajahn. Thank you so much for this retreat. Um, I I started. Ajahn Brahm was. You were the first, one of the first people I started listening to when I got on the path of Buddhism a few years ago. And I'd always hear relax to the max and make friends with your mind. And it just feels like this retreat came at the perfect time. It just sunk that bit deeper in the kindness, like the love I felt on this retreat is, wow, it's actually quite, it's very moving. And I think the Anacampa project is fantastic. And I can see the way you describe. I can see the vision. I can see what it's going to be, and yeah. um, but who knows as well. But also, I'm sure it'll be even more fantastic. For <laughs> so I just want to say thank you so much, and um, any support I can ever give, I'd be happy to offer it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. It's lovely to hear such such enthusiastic feedback, and uh, certainly you can contact us at. Uh, Maybe um, the, Anne Marie could add our email address into the little chat box, our general email address, so that you can do that. And I think Lewis has a question that he'd like to, or a comment to make. Could we, uh, is Lewis still wanting to speak? Hi. 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 Can you see me? Yeah, it's a little bit dark, but because I think you've got some light, I know the light is right in front. I'm yeah. next so I'm keeping the plans alive, but let me turn that off for a bit. <laughs> okay, that's good. I can see very good. Is, yeah. I uh, just want to say thank you to, to both and especially to Ajahn Brahm. I don't think we ever um, communicate directly, but I did send a few letters um, from Manchester to the Australia. And I think 
um, one of your monks actually was the one who pointed me to Venerable Chanda's direction. So oh, good. that was really the start of um, this retreat and for me. And that was really, I'm really grateful for that because I was really struggling for about quite a long time, um, about 10 years meditating without any guidance. And I was probably having more anxiety and because I was, I realized during this retreat, I was just probably ordering the mind to be kind, ordering the mind to let go, <laughs> let by it. And I think this retreat was kind of life-saving almost because I, I, I was at a point that I said to myself, tomorrow is my birthday. So I said to myself, I'm oh. going to join this retreat and then really just try to get some guidance rather than self-teaching myself. And then if it works, that's great. If it doesn't, I'm going to go for medication because I'm really that far off into my anxiety and depression. I don't know what else to do. And I'm, I'm feeling so much better. Like I, I let go of, I, I can finally trust the mind to just do, you know, do what it needs to do. I don't need it to be kind. I don't need it to let go. It finally just do it itself. And that uh -huh. feeling really good it almost like feeling like you suddenly just feel better after a long illness and i uh, thank you and I'm, I'm really looking forward to kind of do this more regularly as well i'm not enough yeah. sure, i'm not sure if there's any way is there any regular activity that you know people can take part after covid also especially and while that's for me i'm also asking for my parents because they just texted me yesterday from indonesia which is Muslim country, um, and they are looking to try to meditate, but because it's a Muslim country and especially the part where they live is from Dan, there isn't any place that they can try to learn. And my mom is English as well, so where, where do they live in Medan? Yeah, Medan. Yeah, I go there regularly. Once a year, I go there uh, outside. Covid time. It's one of my favourite places. All right. I, how how do they know about that? I mean, I mean, uh, is there any? Yeah, uh, Ahi Pasco Foundation. Ahi Pasco Foundation. The email you get that on the web, and you find out where they are. It's all been closed down because of Covid, but have a wonderful time over there. Okay. <laughs> I'm putting that in the chat box. There we well, go. Thank you very much. Termakasi. There's one more person with their hand raised, Ajahn, who'd like to speak. Is that okay for you to yes, take certainly. one more comment? And then I think we'll give you a break and we'll have the rest uh, okay, in, the, yeah. in the next session with me. Okay, very good. Okay, so Alona. Alona. Yeah. Hi, Ajahn Brahm. Hi. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm talking to you. You know, I was I'm yeah. listening to you for so many years. And again, okay. really, I was planning to come to Perth and to come to yeah. your retreat. And it's like, yeah. here you are in my room. I can't believe it. I'm so grateful. Yay. I just, <laughs> oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just, you know, uh, when I came up on the Buddha's teachings, um, it was quite intense experience for me, you know, especially with Four Noble Truths. I knew yeah. that uh, the guy knows what, you know, like it felt like, okay, I found the secret of life. Who can yeah. be you know like it was so when i was my friend said you have to pick the tradition to learn more yeah. i was uh you're the, the first one who had this in youtube videos and uh, oh, i was yes. that listening and uh you know like i wondered how you Theravada treat women and you were actually talking about the bikuni project and all this yeah. and i was it completely opened my heart and i completely like believed you know, 100% that this is, I can follow that because people treat women right as well. And yeah. uh, I just, since then, like it's been eight years ago, I, I listened to all your talks. I follow your suggestions. My life improved. I'm great to be part of the Bikuni project as well. I can support with what I can. I, I love Venerable. Thank you, Venerable Chanda. Uh, and uh, I was, uh, oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> What's wrong with being Go for it! Yay! <laughs> so I'm, I'm just, I'm just so grateful uh, to, you know, to, um, uh, to be able to follow your path. I read all your books, 
and uh, one, one thing you know uh, my heart is so open under meditations and books sometimes yeah. when I, I get a special love and kindness sometimes it gets so uh, deep it, it cracks my eyes and I get scared you know and I pull back but I always come back it's no way back you know yeah. but it's just so uh, um, that fear sometimes you know just like it goes so deep and that place untouched and it just sometimes it freaks me out <laughs> but I always come back <laughs> I was just gonna keep coming back it's just thank you for everything thank you very much because no, yeah, <laughs> after time that's what happens after you get so used to the beauty and the peace and it's so refined and you get into deep meditation it's just so accepting it takes a while to get used to such unconditional love and peace but after a while you keep coming back and you say it's a bit scary but who cares it's just too blissful and too peaceful so you go for it and it's always totally beneficial to you and all your family and friends they see that and don't worry about if you get teary in meditation. There's several times that I cry and I get very, very inspired. So just go for it and be, look after yourself and care for yourself. Care for all beings. It's good to see you. Bye. <laughs> okay. Um, I would just like to end by conveying a few of the messages in the box, Ajahn, for you to hear. Yeah. Just a huge, massive thank you for such a healing retreat with the two best teachers in the world. <laughs> that's nice. I'm, tr I'm having trouble to receive that, but anyway, that's a beautiful. No, we have to receive comment. praise. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and someone else said, "Thank you to Venerable Chanda Ajahn Brahm and all the organisers for a wonderful retreat. I'm so grateful for this opportunity and hope we can all come together in person someday." Fabrizio is saying hello to Stefan. <laughs> oh. um, I think is this Kanchna or Samantha is saying, thank you for the awesome teachings, tireless selfless service and the kind heart. I can safely say this has been one of the best retreats for me. <laughs> and there's also a question about more suttas, doing more sutta teaching. And also... Um, Someone's child said that I wish I could listen to Venerable Chanda all night, and she's only nine years old. Yay. <laughs> it's very <laughs> sweet. Yeah. Um, what else have we got? Uh, yeah, just a lot of gratitude. And someone was asking, when will the word of the Buddha be published? But I'm not sure if and when that might happen. Yeah, I don't but we'll know. let you know. <laughs> but anyway, you got the copy there, and you can sort of bootleg it. <laughs> I'm not really. Concerned. Don't say that, Ajahn. Oops, what about you? Oops. <laughs> no, it is anyway. just for people's personal use. Okay, very good. <laughs> I'm I'm protecting my teacher. <laughs> yeah, <that's> okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah. So. I think that's all. So we're probably going to let Ajahn Brahm go now. And um, <laughs> as for the rest of us, we're going to um, keep the meeting open, but give you a 15 minute break. And for those who'd like to come back after your cup of tea or, or whatever, please do. And we'll have some conversation about absolutely all and anything. And also you'll have chance to meet each other in some smaller groups. That's if, if you're up for that, it's entirely optional. And uh, just last little thing is that I will send out um, an email in a few days with a few of the links to our newsletter, to the retreat teachings and to the donations page and a few other bits and bobs included in that um, email. So look out for that in the next few days. And uh, again, thanking Ajahn Brown on behalf of everyone here yeah, for the absolute okay. world-class teachings. And thank you for the opportunity to serve. Sa yeah. <laughs> Sa and Stefano is Sa here, so Sadhu. They're all well trained, Ajahn. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Take care, everybody. Okay. And I look forward to seeing you again soon.